Welcome to the Sniff Spotlight series. Today we have the privilege of speaking with CJ Bamgartner. She is an executive recruiter at Govigan Associates. CJ, you're an executive recruiter. Tell me a little bit about what you do. So I specialize in recruiting executives in healthcare. I focus primarily in skilled nursing, a lot of work in the Chicago area, and I've been doing it for seven years, anything from property level directors to C-suite executives. So how did you begin your, your career in recruiting? I think like a lot of recruiters, I kind of fell into recruiting. I was working at my company now, Govigan Associates, and then I was also working at a hospital. But while I was working at Govig, I, I fell in love with the company, the culture, my team, and I really enjoyed helping people and talking to people. So I went full board, changed my career path, and I've been doing it for the last seven years, and I'm very grateful. So tell me about the recruiting process for SNF employees. The recruitment process is difficult. So we start with our database and our relationships. We identify the candidates. A lot of people these days can identify a candidate, but our job is to get them through the finish line and to accept an offer. And even into the onboarding process, we're that involved. But we identify the candidates and then after that, it's really important to have selling points for the organization to get them engaged. And then from there, once the candidate is engaged, it's really a team effort. So we have to get our client involved, anybody in the interview process on the same page to always have our sales caps on to get the best candidates out there. And then closing the deal, taking it all the way to the finish line, we help with the offer stage and acceptance, resignations, counter offers, and up until they start. From what I understand, you're saying that it's typically the uh, groups or nursing homes that would come to you and say, hey, I need a new DON or a new clinical director. Is yes. that how it works? Our highest placements last year were directors of nursing. And we also do administrators, sales and marketing directors, regionals, vice presidency suites. The highest level I've placed is a chief operating officer. And yeah, any any level, sometimes we do you know, billers, accounts receivable, managers. I've actually placed an architect before in senior living, so anything in healthcare, I can do. Have there been a staffing shortage on the C-level executives? Not at that level, um, from what I've experienced during the pandemic. There's certainly a more of a candidate-driven market right now, so, you know, a lot of tenure has decreased, there's a lot more turnover, with executives, even frontline staff, it's just at a higher rate. But normally when you get to the C-suite level, there's not as much of a shortage because there's less of them. But CNAs, LPNs, RNs, that's definitely a shortage. Would you say that some executives have also left the space and went into other businesses? Unfortunately, yes. A lot of our candidates and people that we talk to day in and day out are burnt out from the pandemic. and. They have other options, whether it's going into another part of healthcare or working from home with other completely different organizations. We, we have experienced that, which has created a, a shortage. And to make it worse, a lot of states, sometimes licensure is getting more difficult and backed up. So it's even harder to bring people into the industry right now. So I definitely think that there's there's been some challenges that skilled nursing has faced, but that means that companies just have to put their best foot forward to get any kind of candidate, let alone a, a great one. This might be a very good opportunity for some people to maybe go up in ranks within the nursing home space, but it's also a good opportunity for, for someone to use your services. Yes, I, I definitely would. Whether it was with us or another search firm, I think the best companies to get the most options in the marketplace, if they don't have the network and the connections that we have since we've been doing it for 42 years and have over 52 recruiters on staff, I would say, definitely turn to professional that knows the market, has a pulse on the market, and can help bring those candidates to the finish line, not just identify them, but to engage them, know how to talk to these candidates, get them excited, prep all the organizations on how to interview and best practices, and just give a better overall experience to these candidates to get people in the door. But I would definitely say that the companies, especially if they're in growth mode right now, like how much is one good person worth to you? So. You know, if you were to leave and go to another company, you would bring a, a tremendous amount of influence and impact to that company. So I think when it comes to a fee, a lot of that helps when you get a really good professional. 
How do different personalities work for different roles? So I wouldn't say it's necessarily the candidate's personality versus the company's culture and what they're looking for. So I've met really direct salespeople that do a great job and I've met outgoing upbeat nurses that are excellent clinically as well. But if you're going for a company that's in startup mode and they need someone that's very fast paced, entrepreneurial mindset, you know, that's going to be different than a candidate that is more, you know, well established by the book, very presents professionally. I think it, it just depends on the company that what kind of culture they're trying to portray and where they're going as an organization and you fit that candidate into that culture is what I've seen to be the most important thing. So have you ever come across uh, a candidate or somebody who may have been looking for a specific role and you're like, mm -mm, I have the perfect role for you? Yes. We've, we've transitioned candidates from one industry to the other based off of their personalities and based off of the company's culture that I know in-depthly. So it's, it's never good to make a bad match and I always want to make sure the candidate and my clients are happy and if the person has the right personality, they can learn the skill set. You can teach somebody that, but you can't change some, who somebody is. And I've had a lot of success doing that, but typically my clients want somebody with specific experience. They want this, this, and this, and, and then I go find that for them. Or I'm realistic with them and I tell them what's available right now with the best candidates so they can make the best choice out of who's available in the marketplace. But we definitely, help open up candidates to other ideas that they just didn't think of before. We give them the best options that we know they could be a fit for. So you have like an in-depth relationship with these companies? Yes, it's it, very personal. It's a partnership and we develop with clients that, you know, some of them last for decades. So definitely it's, we know them inside and out. It is a little bit more complex. So if I wanted to just shoot over a resume, I could do that to anybody. But if I really, truly cared about the client getting them the best candidate in the marketplace. I want to sell them as if they were myself. Like I want to know them, all of the good points about it, their reputation in the marketplace, the struggles that they have, and I want to find the best candidates that are available to and only present the best ones right now. So it's a lot more of a relationship versus a transaction because I personally want to get them the best people and they that's what, you know, they retain us to do is to find the best people and not send them somebody that's going to leave in two months. So we definitely want to make sure we know the company inside and out so we can make the best match. Same thing with candidates, knowing them very, very well. So how do you get through that facade, for example? A general candidate comes in, how do you really understand who they are? So anybody can show up and say what you want to hear, but to really get to know them, we ask prying questions. I mean, I think if you're vulnerable and you're direct and transparent with somebody, they'll be honest with you. And so as, as a recruiter, I try to break down exactly what it is they're looking for, what's important to them, and then I go from there. So it's not so much pitching out of the gate versus getting to know that person. You can ask them questions that show not only their achievements, but their thought process, how they were able to do something, why they were successful, what they attribute their success to. You can do personality assessments, like behavioral assessments. We use a DISC assessment in our company, and it, it doesn't really like make or break it for the candidate, but it more so shows their how they like to be managed, how they like to be communicated with, and then it gives our clients some more insight as to who they are and what they may be good at or what they may struggle with and how to support them better. So that's how you can find out a little bit more than just what's on the surface level. Tell me a little bit more about, you had mentioned DISC analysis of this test, what is that? A lot of times when you interview for a position, companies have their own behavioral assessments or they'll want to use our assessment. Some companies don't believe in it, but it's just a X amount of questions that the candidate, get, the pe person gets asked and afterwards the results are typically pretty accurate. It shows whether they're gregarious, whether they would prefer systems versus something off the cuff or whether they're more introverted or extroverted and you know if they were struggling how to connect with them or speak to them some people prefer a, you know praises in front of groups some people prefer to be more private so it's it's really a, an assessment to show that on paper so that 
the hiring authority and the candidate can know what their personality shows based off of that and it's, it's typically pretty accurate. How important are references and how much weight does it carry? Some people think they're important and some people think that everyone gives their references to their friends so of course they're going to be good but when I ask for references I want to know who was your previous boss, who were your last two managers and if the candidate doesn't want to provide that or they can't provide it for X reason, it's a red flag. I think it's always good to know, you know, if what your manager, your previous manager says about you. And then on the flip side, if somebody has a short stint at an organization, like they've only been there for a year or a few months and they go to something new, a way to combat that to help present them to my client or to get them an interview is to say, hey, do you have a reference from your previous manager or your boss? Can I call them? Can we get one from them? Because it'll show that, no, this is really why they left. It's not because they, didn't, they weren't good at their position. So I think they're important, and I think it's good to talk to previous managers or if someone we were placing is going to be a high level multiple direct reports, we would want to know maybe somebody that reported to them and how that was like for them to see what kind of manager they might be. So it's just a little bit more insight to get. Do you help train some of your candidates in order to help them secure a position? Yes. Just how I train my clients to perhaps interview better, I get feedback from both sides. So I think it's to make it as smooth and successful as possible. I prep my candidates completely so that they know what they're going into. They know where to park, they know who they're going to be meeting, they know what time, where, and I make sure that's all set up and so it's very easy because everyone's working, everybody's busy, so you have to make it as clean cut as possible. And then for my clients, if they some may not even realize that they have a very poor interview system or their questions aren't good or their demeanor is, you know, people take the time out of their day away from their family, away from work to interview. And if you don't give them a positive interview experience, it's going to set a bad tone in the marketplace. Like branding is everything these days. So I definitely want to help out my clients and make sure that they put their best foot forward to give the candidate a great experience. And then for candidates, of course, some people don't interview every day. So I always prep them if they need help and to make sure that they have their ducks in a row when it comes to what to expect and everything like that. So how do you prep your applicants? Well, say for example, you were going to be interviewing. I would hone in on exactly what's important to you and I would encourage you to ask those questions to the organization that you were interviewing with. And I would role play with you if you needed help. I would talk about your weaknesses, your strengths, your achievements. Some people don't speak highly about themselves because they're so used to giving the credit away to other people. Very strong leaders do that often. And so it's hard for some people to brag about themselves, but I let them do it to me so that in the interview, they can speak highly of themselves and accurately to the client. And then anything that they have concerns on, I cover with them. There's Everybody has a, a flaw or a concern, but if you talk about it ahead of time, it makes it less scary in the interview. And yeah, typically it takes 30 minutes to an hour for me to prep a candidate for just one interview. How is it with negotiating salary and things like that? Well, like I said earlier, you always want to make sure that it's the best match possible. So if I'm working with a client, I know what they're looking for and what they can afford budget-wise for this person's compensation package. And then with the candidates, I know exactly who I can target and what their salary expectation is to make sure that that matches. When it comes to negotiation, it's a very big psychological play because nobody wants to be you know, shorthanded. Nobody wants to pay above and beyond to get somebody because with more money comes more expectations and with less money comes more counter offers, quicker turnover, they don't feel as valued. So you have to make sure that both sides are on the same page. And so the way to combat that is you talk about salary early and often. And you talk about it with both sides too. So nobody should be, you know, thrown for a loop when it comes to the offer stage. You should always bring up salary ahead of time. And I know that clients, a lot of times, even candidates, they feel awkward talking about salary, but that's why it's our job to make sure that everybody's on the same page. And at the end of the day, the candidate is excited about the offer and the client feels good about the offer that they made. And it's all about communication and just educating both sides and setting expectations. So we talk about it almost every call.
So all you guys talk about is money? Yeah, that's all that's important. Uh, no, like that. it's not. I mean, salary is definitely important, especially these days. I think money definitely talks when you're talking to any executive because so much is public and everybody knows everybody in this industry. So you want to, if you want the best candidate, are getting more and more expensive these days. So has COVID changed the salary shift and the expectations? I've never seen this big of a salary jump in my career. And it's because it's a it's a candidate-driven market. There's not enough people. People are leaving the industry because it's difficult. And so companies are having to be more competitive and it's just spiking the prices. But that's what it takes to get the best candidates. And if you don't have someone really good on your team, how much is that going to cost you overall to have agency or to have the wrong leader in place? It, it's sometimes more expensive to put the wrong person in place. So you want to make sure that when you find the right person, you get them on board and you keep them there. And the way that you keep them there is a good salary, a great culture, and you support them. Were salaries affected during the pandemic and how? The salaries were impacted. I've seen a huge jump in salaries versus five years ago, they might have been an easy $20,000 less. And this is for director levels. When you go higher than that, they, they're a little bit higher as well. So with the pandemic and just right now and today, there is a shortage of candidates and it's making companies fight more competitively for them, which means higher salary wages, more counter offers, which bump up the salaries. And so I definitely think that I've seen a, a large salary increase on candidates in the market. What percentage would you say if you had to guess? 25, 30 percent, sometimes 50. I mean, it depends on the level of position and how much the company can afford, but a lot of executives, you know, they don't realize what the market is paying. And so as a recruiter, once we identify them for one of our clients and ask where they're at salary wise, it just opens up their mind to what they're missing out of just because they've been such a loyal person and they haven't really been looking. So they don't know what the marketplace pays now if they were to make a change. So it keeps, keeps everybody pretty honest. Would you ever advise high-level executives from a different industry to use that same skill set and come into the nursing home space? Yes, I think there are selling points and a lot of people that get into the industry and stay in it is because of passion and because they love what they do and they're there to help people. So if you're coming into it and you're, you're unhappy with your current company, they have a bad culture or you don't feel like you're living the life that you wanted, I'd say healthcare and skilled nursing, it can be a very rewarding industry to be in. And you could be making more money too if you were to make a change with some of these companies and what they can afford. So I think there's definitely some selling points to get into senior living and skilled nursing that other companies just don't have. And I would advise that they take a look at it because there's a lot of options out there right now. And if you love what you do, then you have a good life. Would any industry specifically transfer over well into the elder care space? Anything that's very hospitality driven, like we've placed a lot of executives that come from hotels or any industry where there's a lot of hospitality and they do really well as executive directors because they're used to operations and dealing with people and you know, having a product where you have to have a really good hospitality focus on it. If we were to transition them into operations and sales and marketing, all of those are very transferable skills. If you can manage people um, or if you're excited about what you're selling, you know, if you believe in the product, then I think it's an easy transition to sell hospice or senior living or skilled nursing. And then clinically, the nurses, you know, they have holidays off, they have a more stable work schedule. Well, there's not 12 hour shifts like the hospital, so they get a lot back when they go into healthcare in, in that niche. There's probably a very big opportunity to get some highly qualified people into the SNF space for maybe even less money because they're just, there's just not a, enough work there. Yeah, exactly. So if they have that, what you're looking for, and they're a good cultural fit, personality fit, then I think. Companies need to look outside of the industry to pull people into it. It's inevitable, and whoever is ahead of that is going to be ahead of the game. 
So having that pipeline and getting people certified or paying for their schooling or you know, having an excellent marketplace uh, branding is going to be big for these companies to fill their pipeline with executives. But the biggest advice I would give them is to try to have such a good culture and support the employees educationally where that they can groom from within and they can promote from within. That's, that tends to be the most loyal candidates are the ones that have been treated so well, compensated, promoted, given more additional responsibilities. And so, yes, you have to look from outside the industry and we can find people like that. But a lot of times when companies are looking for a, a certain person in skilled nursing, they want someone with experience because it's just a very unique industry. It's highly regulated and if you don't know everything, then you're gonna be a liability. I do think it's good to bring outside perspective in because they're not tainted by any bad practices. They don't know certain company reputations, good or bad, and they're just going to go full force into it. And so to get somebody green in the industry, it can be a, a good thing. And again, it just depends on the person and how much training they're going to need, how much support they're going to need, how quickly they can pick up on everything with the learning curve. But it does, I have seen it done, been done very successfully, bringing somebody in from outside of the industry. It just brings new energy to the field, so. CJ, thank you so much for coming in and joining me on the SNF Spotlight. It's been amazing to meet you, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me.